The purpose of today's video is two reviews for the price of one, or the attention span of one, I should say, because that's a thing. Radeon RX 580 and the Radeon RX 570. Alternately, this video could be titled The Return of the Mystery Budget Gamer Theater something. But we're going to take a look at both of these cards in this video for budget gaming and OEM system upgrades. Stay tuned. Sometimes I feel like, you know, the most interesting man in the world, not because I am, no, that's not at all, because he says, stay thirsty, my friends, and instead it's a stay engaged, my friends, because our analytics need it. Oh, oh God. Uh, uh, uh. Before we get into these, let's unpack them and take a look at the aesthetics. I've been able to remove the security sticker with no hint that anything has gone wrong. It's probably bad. It's the 580. Let's see if I can do it, uh, repeat performance on the 570. Oh yes. Well, that's bad news for retailers everywhere, unless they shrink wrap. So the 570, got the driver CD. Why do you even bother with driver CDs anymore? Jesus. Warranty card, installation manual, the Sapphire, you know, important product registration thing. Ooh, we got a nice padded bag. There we go. There is the 570. Yes, this is the 570. Look at that. Okay, we're gonna set that over there. Hopefully, hopefully that'll stay. I'm gonna very carefully repack this. Because <laughs> this is a loner. <laughs> Basically, all I gotta do with this is plug it in some old machines and see how well it does for an upgrade. Now let's do the, let's do the 580. What do you know? <laughs> Driver CD, registration, installation manual. Oh, this is all seeming spookily familiar. Padded bag, packed in exactly the same way. Feels slightly heavier, but I might be imagining it. Yeah, I'm probably imagining it. So there is the 580. Oh, I hope I don't get them mixed up when I'm repacking them. That would be bad. Now, out of the box, these are both the dual slot cards. Looks like they would work fine even on motherboards where there's not really a lot of clearance between the individual slots. Both of these have an eight pin power connector. So you're gonna need a power supply that provides an eight pin power connector. Both of these um, will consume quite a bit of power. The 570 will use up to 150 watts of power. The 580 will use up to 185, 190 watts of power depending on if you tweak settings and do some other stuff. So keep that in mind when you're estimating your power supply wattage and all the other peripherals in your system. 150 watts for the 570, 185, 190 watts for the 580. Now these cards are pretty basic. There's no RGB, there's no anything like that, but that's not to imply that they're bad or cheaply made. Actually, I wanna call attention to the uh, construction quality and the build quality. They've got a solid metal back plate. It feels very sturdy, the construction in the hand, just the way that it works. The plastic shroud, the way that it covers it, the fans are dual ball bearing. It looks like it would be pretty easy to replace the uh, fan shroud if that came to it or something like that. It's got a pretty big heat sink assembly in both cases. The 570 has a dual heat pipe assembly. The uh, 580 looks like it's got a quad heat pipe assembly. They both seem to use the high quality polymer capacitors. The chokes look like they're pretty high quality as well. I would be surprised if these graphics cards don't last for years, even under heavy operation, even you know dealing with high temperatures and that sort of thing. Now the connectors on the back, you've got two DisplayPort 1.2 connections and two HDMI connections, so it's perfect for DVR. And you of course also have the DVI connection, and that is the same on both cards. So I know what you're thinking, it's like late April, you know, early May of 2017, the 570 and the 580 came out. And on paper, they look pretty close to the 480 and the 470 that came out of June of last year. So the 470 and the 480 have been on the market for less than a year. And we have these cards that come out that are almost identical. They're, they're basically very similar um, to the 400 series cards. What has AMD done? Well, you know, harshly, somebody might say they have just rebranded the 400 series chips to be the 500 series chips. And really that's not terribly inaccurate. That's, that's really what AMD has done. The big differences this time around between the 400 series and the 500 series is that they've tweaked the silicon a little bit, but the big changes are in software. So when the 400 series cards were released, they were brand new, the drivers were not super optimized. Um, as we've seen in the past year for the 400 series cards, the performance has improved dramatically in some cases for some games because of optimizations, because the raw compute power here 
is, is pretty significant. I mean, the raw compute power in terms of like how much computation you can actually get done on the card uh, is significant and the performance is less than you would expect given the com computational horsepower of those 400 series cards. Well, with the 500 series cards, because it's just a tweak to the 400 series silicon, out the gate, the performance is actually pretty good. And so you see new software features like Radeon Chill. Radeon Chill is aimed at making it so that the graphics card doesn't draw more frames than your monitor is physically capable of, whether your monitor is limited to 60 hertz or your monitor is limited to 120 hertz, whatever that happens to be. That said, the 570 is aimed at 1080p 60 FPS gaming. That's on you know high or ultra settings in, in your particular game. And the 580 is aimed at 60 FPS gaming for 1440p. And so AMD is sort of changing their marketing message around a little bit. Most people don't have monitors that will go above 60 hertz. Very few have monitors that will go above 75 hertz. And so for the vast majority of gamers, if you can deliver a good experience at 60 FPS, the limit of your monitor, then that's good enough. And so if you have a 1080p monitor or you want to game at 1080p, they say, well, the 570 is good enough for that. And if you want something that's a little bit more, a little bit higher settings, maybe it would handle an unoptimized game a little bit better, well, then there's the 580. And AMD goes so far as to say that 1440p gaming is possible with the 580. And I have to say in testing, they're, that's basically right on the money. I mean, the claim that they make, I can see why they're making the claim. These are very affordable cards for the level of performance that they offer. But the important thing to keep in mind with these cards is that they're not marketed at anybody that has bought their graphics card really, certainly in the last year, probably the last two years. There are a lot of people out there that are running, you know, like an R7 260 or even like a 7600 series or 7800 series or a 7900 series AMD graphics cards or like an NVIDIA, you know, GT 660 or maybe a GTX 660, those really old graphics cards. And, you know, their, their computer, the CPU, I mean, if they're rocking a Sandy Bridge quad core, you really don't need much of an upgrade to enjoy 1080p or 1440p gaming today. So you don't really need to do much with your computer other than upgrade the graphics card. And I have to agree with that reasoning. That's completely, I mean, if you look at our Curing Console Otis videos, you know, we're upgrading these ancient Sandy Bridge Dell machines with a graphics card. Now, a problem that our users on the forum ran into is that a lot of 400 series graphics cards, when you add it to those OEM machines, it wouldn't post or there was some sort of a problem or power delivery problem or something like that on the 400 series cards when those came out a year ago. One would hope that the hardware has been improved. And so we are doing testing with these graphics cards on those older machines. We've got an HP workstation, an older HP workstation. We've got some Dell i5 workstations and even a small form factor machine that we're gonna put a new power supply in because some of these OEM machines don't have a sufficient power supply to run these. Again, remember, 150 watts, 185 watts. So we're gonna take a look at using these in an OEM system and upgrading it because if you can pick up a business surplus desktop like these, certainly for less than $100, that's not uncommon, then you could end up spending 300, 350, $400, get a Sandy Bridge or an Ivy Bridge desktop, put in one of these new graphics cards, and you've got a really good 1080p, maybe 1440p gaming machine. Now, since these are the Pulse cards, they're not as aggressively overclocked as some of the other 570s and 580s that you can find. That said, the 580, the boost clock is 1366 megahertz, which is really not bad for a 580. The boost clock of the 570 is 1244 megahertz. Now both of these have GDDR5 memory with this 570 having four gigs of memory and this 580 having eight gigs of memory. The eight gigs is suitable for 1440p, maybe even 4K at some games like Overwatch if you know 60 FPS is not really exactly what you're after. That said, 1440p and 1080p at really high FPS, like if you've got a 144 hertz monitor, you're probably gonna want the 580 if you wanna run the really high frame rate. But if you've got one of our curing console-itis builds or on a commodity desktop, well then the 570 might be a better choice. Um, the box does not come with any adapters like these. This is a dual six pin to eight pin adapter. Um, so these are both eight pin cards. So you really ideally need an eight pin cable connector. That said, a six pin connector will fit in there. Let's try it in some OEM systems. First up, we've got this Dell Vostro i5. This is manufactured, I think, in 2011. Ugh. So let's turn this around and open it up. All right, we've got HDMI 1 set as our output, everything plugged in. Power on the motherboard. No post. 
Now we tried the 580 in the Dell without a power supply upgrade, didn't work. We're gonna try the 570 now. So the 570 didn't work. We'll give it a shot with the power adapter because you never know. So if their Dell power supply doesn't work, let's swap it. Now normally I would, you know, unmount this and unscrew it. We're actually gonna have to use this power supply on a bunch of different systems, so I'm not gonna do that. Uh, we're just gonna lay it up here on top of the computer. Look at that, a single, actual, real, eight pin power adapter. All right, let's turn it on and see what happens. It helps if you turn the switch on. We have life, but do we have life? No post. Okay, so we've upgraded the power supply to a proper power supply and still with the 570, no post. Probably gonna have to take out the Sapphire, put the original graphics card back in, see if there's a UEFI update. So on platforms that don't have DD, the easiest way to make a bootable USB stick is Rufus. So download Rufus, Rufus can make a FreeDOS USB stick, just do that. Hey, look at that, we booted directly into FreeDOS. Nice. Okay, our old version's AO3, new version's AO6, update the BIOS. Yes. So now we've updated our UEFI, and we've shut the system down again. We're gonna shove the 570 back in there. All right, we get the graphics card shoved in there. Let's see if it boots. Well, it still doesn't boot. New power supply, new UEFI. If you've got a Vostro 430 or a XPS 8300, which is basically the same system, you're not gonna be able to install even the 500 series graphics card. The machines that we tried, we tried a Dell Optiplex 980, a Dell Optiplex 780, an HP Compact Workstation 6200, and we also tried a Vostro 430, which is the same as an XPS 8200. Uh, across the board, we could not get a post from the 570 or the 580. We also had a 550 on hand that we decided to try for fun. It didn't work in anything either, except for the Optiplex 980. It would boot in the Optiplex 980, and it would also boot in the HP 6200. But the other machines, it would not boot. That one doesn't even require external power, so it's not really a power delivery or a power option. It's just some problem, some compatibility issue between the UEFI and these OEM systems, which is too bad because I think a lot of people probably buy these to upgrade their older machines. Uh, if you have a white box machine that you've built that still has a Sandy Bridge processor, well, obviously that will work fine with the uh, 570 or the 580, and those machines are good candidates for this type of upgrade. Uh, so now we're back to the desk. We've tested it in OEM systems and can't really recommend it there over the NVIDIA counterparts. Well, what about the promise of 1080p gaming and 1440p gaming? Well, you guys might remember these. This is a Shimian monitor that I've recommended in the past. Sort of discovered these from Korea and we've had these for years and years and years and generally these monitors have worked really well. I still use these. Uh, this is a 1440p, 2560 by 1440 uh, monitor, 60 hertz. And I can say that the RX 580 lives up to its promise of good gaming experience on this display. I think that overall the promise of good gaming at 1080p or 1440p, these cards live up to it. I mean, the Radeon, I mean, it offers a good value for what it is. You don't need to spend four or $500 or more on a graphics card for a good gaming experience, unless you want, you know, an insane frame rate at 1440p or an exceedingly insane frame rate at 1080p. But by and large, most people are not gaming at that. I mean, a lot of monitors that are advertised that they're faster than 60 hertz, in reality, the panel itself is not really faster than 60 hertz. You can see two frames at once and crazy stuff like that. So even though these don't really work all that great in OEM systems, if you're building a system, you know, an i5 middle of the road gaming system or a well-balanced rig, I still recommend these cards. I think that the 570 and the 580 from AMD really honestly are the best value per dollar um, on the market for gaming, for most games, for just about anything else that's out there. Me personally, I'd probably go for the 580 because it's got more graphics memory and will push more resolutions. And I really like gaming at the native resolution on the 1440p systems that, that I've used. So I, I kind of recommend that, but if you've only got a 1080p display and you aren't planning on doing anything with VR or doing anything on anything like that, honestly, the 570 is fine. But I should be clear, the people that should upgrade are people that have really ancient graphics cards. I'm talking a graphics card that's more than three years old, probably. Uh, certainly more than two and a half years old, probably more than three years old. Really ancient NVIDIA graphics, really ancient AMD graphics. Maybe even the graphics card that came with your system, as long as you, know, you don't have an OEM system or you know that it's gonna work for a fact in your system. 
Now I should also mention Radeon Chill. What Radeon Chill does is it's a little different than frame rate targeting where it's like, okay, my graphics card can display 60 hertz. I'll turn V-Sync on. The graphics card is only gonna render 60 frames. Radeon Chill works a little different in that um, if there's user input, it'll go ahead and render the frame um, so you can get more than 60 hertz, uh, even if your display doesn't necessarily support 60 hertz. So, I mean, ideally that, that means that it would be best paired with a free sync display, but if you're not doing anything on the screen or there's no user input, then the, the, if there's no reason to draw a new frame, the graphics card is not going to draw a new frame. So that reduces heat production, that reduces power usage, maybe makes things a little bit more stable because of the reduced heat load. Both of these cards support the additional features that FreeSync 2 brings to the table. FreeSync 2 brings things like high dynamic range and a bunch of other really cool features that we should look for on upcoming monitors. Both of these cards support FreeSync 2. So overall, what's the verdict? Well, like I was saying before, I really think the red team has the better value proposition for cards around the $200 mark at this point. If you're building a new system, you really honestly should consider these cards. I mean, DirectX 12 support OpenCL, the performance in raw teraflops, I mean, I really like these cards. The most disappointing thing is that you can't use them in an OEM system for an upgrade the way that you can Team Green cards, or at least it seems like Team Green cards are a little bit more compatible. But overall, I think these cards are the better value at the price point. Oh, if you do pick up one of these cards and use it in an OEM system and it works or doesn't, I guess, let us know in the forums. Maybe we can build a table of known good systems. Dell 9020 works, but again, the other systems that I tested don't work. And the 9020 only works with the latest UAFI. For what that's worth, I don't know, I guess direct your hate mail to the forum at Level 1 Text. That's where I'm going to be hanging out. And I'll see you there. I'm Wendell, and I'm signing out.